next up, we've got Ulysses Albuquerque, just from PSNC. Uh, he's a principal security consultant, and he is a DevOps or DevSecOps and Agile advocate. And he's going to talk about software composition analysis deep dive. That's going to be exciting. <laughs> I'm going to drop down the lights. And ta -da -da. there you go. It's up. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay. Uh, so before I start, just a quick show of hands. How many of you attended Nina's talk on a similar subject to this <laughs> after lunch? Cool. Not too many then. Then, uh, yeah, there is some overlap, but we'll try to make this quick and fun. Uh, so, yeah, formalities out of the way. So, I'm uh, Ulysses Albuquerque, consultant at uh, the SNC Group. Some mandatory disclaimers these are my views, not my employers. We'll be talking a lot about JavaScript, which thankfully is not what some of the other speakers focused on, which should make this a bit more fun, doesn't mean that it's because things in JavaScript are different. It's just because software composition analysis and remediation in, particularly, in particular are more, uh, the problems are more exacerbated in the JavaScript uh, space. So this is going to be a good showcase for the kind of stuff that can go wrong and when things get really complicated to properly fix. I also am uh, Brazilian and have a tendency to swear at times. I apologize in advance if I do that. It's not intentional. <laughs> and this is a problem we're talking about. This is, so first this is blatantly copied from the Hack in the Box Malaysia, I believe, keynote from last year's. It was from uh, Mark Raffi from uh, SourceClear. That talk is freaking awesome if you guys find it online. I'll, I'll make the slides available as well, and you can see the link down at the bottom, so you get the link for that as well. Do watch it. They talk about the whole problem around uh, dependency management and how those things are growing and getting out of hand, and how you can, you, you can no longer do these things manually, pretty much. That's the, the focus of his talk, right? So, as you can see, the numbers are growing exponentially, uh, and uh, we are close to 800,000 I believe by this was 2016, so we are probably over 800,000 uh, open source dependencies already easily, which means that keeping track of that stuff manually is obviously not feasible anymore. Uh, and this was already mentioned in a number of talks. Pretty much everything we build these days includes a ton of code that was not written by us, right? And uh, you pretty much accept that the people who wrote that code have done their jobs properly and that thing is properly secured and whatever. In reality, we'll find that that's not really the case. And uh, as a good example of that, how many of you guys were aware of this when it happened? Okay, so this was really, really fun. Uh, this was a tiny, tiny, tiny Node.js module called LeftPad. And what left pad does is it pads strings with spaces to align them to the left, right? So pretty simple, easy. The, the whole thing fits in probably 15 lines of code, right? And the story about this is interesting. So what happened is that the guy had another module called kick, K-I-K. And apparently that's trademark of someone that someone reached out to NPN and said, hey, I want this thing removed. The developer got pissed and he said, okay, you want that removed? I'll remove all my stuff. And then he deleted over 250 projects I had published on NPN. And the problem is, and we'll get to that later when we talk about transitive dependencies and all the fun stuff, this broke a crap ton of stuff on NPM because everyone depended on this. And like, this is literally 15 lines of code. But because of the way we build software these days, it's so intertwined with dependencies, we have no control over the ability for someone to pull something like that and completely make our abuse fail is, is kind of scary, right? And obviously, and uh, Nina went into this in depth, like you guys probably saw this one as well, right? So Equifax, 
the interesting thing about Equifax was that uh, it was something that people gave the company a really hard time about because they said, hey, a patch had been available for two months. It's your fault that you got owned. Once you have done with this talk, if I do my job properly, you realize it's not as simple as that. That's a very simplistic way of looking at the problem of software composition analysis, of knowing that you have a non-vulnerable dependency in your software and actually remediating that, right? So yeah, Equifax, right? And uh, another interesting tidbit is that it's estimated that 65% of the Fortune 100, right, use struts, which is the same library that got Equifax pound. So we're not talking about small business here. We're not talking about people who don't have the budget or don't have the capability to fix this. We're talking about companies that supposedly had access to all the resources required to do this properly. Right? So the fact that this didn't happen to more companies was probably more because everyone got scared about what happened to Equifax and rushed to fix their stuff rather than because they, they were doing due diligence regarding dependency management and software composition analysis in their current practice. Right? Oh, and by the way, this is CVE 2017-6538 in case anyone likes to know specifics. And it's trivial to exploit. This is literally a header, right? Which gets us to A9 of the WASP top 10, right? And uh, hopefully everyone knows about this already. This has been covered a number of talks already. I won't go at length into this. So the first problem we have then is in order to not be the next Equifax, how do I know which components I use in my organization, right? That's the first problem, visibility, right? So pretty much, I need a, a bill of materials or a manifest or whatever it is that all applications, services, and everything else that's being built in my organization is using as part of our builds, right? This relies on three very important pieces of information. First, your application manifest. Second, on vulnerability data sources. Nina mentioned this on her talk, right? So every vendor will have a different data source for vulnerability information. We'll be discussing a bit about that. And finally, on dependency metadata. So essentially, what you want to do is you want to combine all of these things, and, you, and what you want, want to find is, do I have anything that comes from a manifest that is linked to a vulnerability that I can correlate based on the vulnerability metadata that I have available on Oh, sorry, on the dependency metadata that I have available from this thing, either because I parsed the file or because the build system gave me that information or whatever other source I have. All those things are very too specific, very build system specific, and very dependency management solution specific. We go a bit down the rabbit hole in that in a minute, but we need to have all three, right? For the focus of this presentation, we're gonna be focused on these guys. Uh, so we have OWASP dependency check. It's an OWASP conference. We gotta talk about the OWASP tooling, right? We're gonna be talking about source clear, Black Duck, and SNIC. Uh, I would try to remain vendor neutral, but I have my preferences. I hope they don't show up during the talk, but uh, if they do, whatever. And. Uh, there's also the possibility of looking at this problem from the artifact registry or binary registry perspective, which is using those guys as proxies to prevent content from actually being injected into your builds. We're gonna be talking about this later. We're talking about the visibility perspective here, so we wanna know what people are using in their builds. We're not even talking about remediation at this point. So these are the guys that we'll probably be using to get that, right? So this is a WASP dependency check. Uh, I did the nice animations just in case we did not have internet, but we can run a proper demo of this. So we'll be using, for most of our demos, a WASP juice shop, right, which is a Node.js application, quite massive. We're gonna be using NPM as our dependency management solution. We're gonna be, in the case of a WASP dependency check, they pretty much use NVD data, CVEs, 
right? We're going to be talking a bit about the limitations of that as well. And also, due to the way that OS dependency check works, it does require file system access to actually find the files which hold the dependencies so it can go and enumerate those, extract the metadata from them, and actually compare that against the vulnerability feeds it, it, it uses for... Uh... But essentially, this is what you get with OS dependency check. And what we're trying to show here is that you scan it, by default, if you just use OWASP dependency check, you get a bunch of files. You get XML files, JSON files, and uh, CSV files. Uh, most of them are for machine consumption, obviously, but you also have, you, get, you also get a nice HTML report, which looks like this. But since we have internet access, I'll show you guys how this works. So it's as simple as that, right? So. I'm running it this I'm inside juice shop. I'm gonna run it as project juice shop and I'm gonna be outputting the thing in all the supported formats. The first thing it does, and it's shown here as the first line, is it will try to check whether the NVD data it has is stale or not. Right? In our case, just our data is not stale. Ah, come on. Let me go back here. Our data is not stale because I just ran this, so it's it's just showing us there. And, it, and you can see here that it tries to run a bunch of different analyzers, right? The analyzers are essentially uh, parsers for different types of artifacts or manifest files. And this is how dependency, tracks, dependency check tries to extract dependency metadata information. So in the case of a node project, they will parse package JSON files from both your main application and from the dependencies of your application recursively. Right, and if we open this thing, it looks like that report we just saw, and there are a bunch of interesting things here we'll be talking about, right? So first, it says here we have a little over 1,800 dependencies on this thing, right? Out of which a little over 1,300 are unique. This comes in via transitive dependencies. We discussed that a bit. It also talks about vulnerable dependencies here. There. It talks about number of vulnerabilities, right? Uh, and in here, it talks about coordinates. Coordinates are essentially the indexing criteria through which dependency check will correlate whatever it found about your dependencies with the vulnerability data sources. In this case, what it will do is it will try to match those against CVEs, CPEs. So I believe Matt Jones mentioned the, the whole CVE, CPE in a, during his talk, but essentially what, we, what we're going to be trying to do here is if anything on a CPE mask matches any of those coordinates, this means that that thing is vulnerable, right? And this is one of the major limitations we have with a solution based on free data sources such as CVEs and OWASP dependency check. CVE quality is all over the place. You have some really nice findings with people that have done their job properly and they have managed to fine tune this thing to just match what's really real. Some of them will just go, yeah, I just tested on this version. I just assumed that anything from this version below is vulnerable, whatever, I don't care. As long as I get my CVE, I don't care. And uh, particularly when you get to older uh, vulnerabilities, the quality of the data unfortunately tends to get worse as well because people back in the day used to be a lot less cautious about the quality of data they fed into these things, right? The other thing, we also get into that, not every vulnerability gets a CVE. So, yeah. Finally, the other thing we have here is CPE confidence, which is not, which is, is not showing for some reason. Okay, interesting. But yeah, here it shows us how exactly it found the thing. So for example, let's take JWS here. So if I click on it, it will tell me, yeah, like I find this guy, found this guy here. These are the checksums. It's referenced in this thing. Here's your evidence. And it theoretically matches all of this stuff here to confirm that this is the actual dependency that is affected by this specific vulnerability, right? And then it mentions the, and as you can see here, 
it's one of those cases where it's kind of broad. Does it mean that 2.0 is vulnerable? We don't know. Is, does, is it even exploitable in the same way? We don't know, right? But anyway, so this is the kind of report you get with uh, something like dependency check. And I know, I know I, I mentioned a lot of bad stuff about this, but you get this for free. So regardless, you should be using this. If you can afford anything, you should be using this because not using this is definitely worse than using it and doing proper triage. You will at least be finding something if you use a tool like a WASP dependency check. If you combine that with dependency track, which does offer you additional data sources, even better. But with just something like this, you at least get some coverage. But be aware that CVE data is not that great. Right? But more importantly, let's talk about the dependency stuff, right? So I'm here in Juice Shop. And then I just check my package JSON, and then I check the dependencies element in my package JSON, and it says it is 47 elements long, right? So I do that for my dev dependencies as well, and it's 37. And then I do this for all the other package JSONs that come with the application, because this actually is a single page application, so it uses package JSON for both the backend and the front end components of this thing. So there are multiple. So in total, what I have is 110 libraries, right? But I did count, if you guys remember, over 1,800, right? So all of those are coming via transitive dependencies. And this is a very important thing because transitive dependencies, they become a graph, right? So this means that we cannot take something such as a package JSON, and I'll show you guys what a package JSON looks like just in case someone never saw one. It's literally this. And in here, you will find our dependencies. We're talking about those version specifications in a bit as well. Uh, but you can see there's definitely not over a thousand of them here, right? And my dev dependencies, the same stuff. There's definitely not a thousand of them here, okay? So why the hell then am I getting that many? Right, so this is actually the most important job of a dependency management solution like NPM, Maven, or uh, whatever else you guys use in your environments. If you're using Ruby, that would probably be RubyGems. If you're using Python, that would be PIP. If you use some other platform, it would be whatever solution your platform offers. The thing is, this is the main job of dependency resolution systems. It should actually determine the whole dependency tree see what depends on what, see which restrictions are applied to the relationship between those dependencies, because that's what those numbers actually tell us. I'm not just relying on Karma CLI. I'm actually relying on Karma CLI on a version that matches the spec. So it's not just any regular version of Karma CLI, right? And uh, this is the bulk of their job. And this is what a dependency tree looks like for a very, very simple JavaScript uh, library. So Bunyan is a login framework, pretty simple login framework, logs JSON messages. If you guys are doing Node.js microservices, you'll probably use something like this. And it has a small number of dependencies, but even then you will find that it gets two levels deep. So if I'm the author of Bunyan and I find that any one of those guys is vulnerable Fixing that is simply a matter of changing my package JSON to say, hey, I'm no longer using MV200. I'm actually using now MV210. And maybe that's the fixed version. Awesome. Remediation with a single commit. As long as my unit tests are running perfectly, as long as, as long as my regression tests are running perfectly, we're assuming a proper true DevOps team here with enough automation testing in their tool belt. Then this means that fixing this is a matter of simply updating one line in a file. However, these guys here, I have no direct control over because MV depends on three different things, right? So if one of those is, diff is, is vulnerable and the MV developer does nothing about it, I'm left 
with a vulnerable dependency I inherited through MV. Right? And this is one of the biggest problems we have in this space. And this is, in the JavaScript world, a tiny, tiny, tiny library. Okay? If you get to more real world stuff, it can get complicated like this. And this thing here introduces another problem. Now I have cycles. Now I have things which depends on which come from different paths. So imagine that Bayesian Base64 URL is vulnerable, right? It's being injected via JSON Web Token, JWS, JWA, and Base64 URL, and it's also being injected via this path here. So unless both of those guys change their dependencies to not include the non-vulnerable version of this, I'm still screwed. Okay? And if you go to a real-world thing, that's juice shop, and it's not even the whole thing. Right? If you want to see the whole thing, this site is actually quite awesome, so let's show you guys. Uh, if you want to see the whole thing. Let's take something like Express. If you do... Node development, you probably use Express at some point. Express depends on all this crap, right? And uh, yeah, this is Express, okay? So you can clearly see the cycles here. Like this guy here, check out how many incoming arrows it has, right? So each one of those incoming arrows is something that depends on it. If this guy is vulnerable, good luck getting rid of it. You know, so... This actually introduces an interesting problem we will talk about when we talk about remediation, which is in software composition analysis, remediation effort is probably not symmetrical to identification effort, unlike a lot of other practices, where it's like aesthetic code analysis, unless you have an architectural problem, changing code to do something in a slightly different way that makes you less vulnerable or completely mitigates a problem is potentially doable. With something like this, there's no such guarantee. You find a vulnerable dependency, it might be injected via a thousand different paths in your, in your application. Good luck getting rid of that, getting rid of that. It's really, really hard, right? And, uh, yeah, so this introduces another interesting problem, which is the application manifest is not enough for us to determine the full dependency resolution tree, right? So, we need to rely on some external third party, in this case, the package, the dependency resolution manager, to build this tree for us, right? In practice, what this means is there's no such thing as, yes, we support software composition analysis in Java, or we support software composition analysis in, I don't know, Go, because you do not support a language, you support a build or dependency resolution manager's particular implementation of that because each different system uses different metadata to determine which package is a requirement of other package, right? So in the case of Juice Shop, if we run with something like SNCC, which is a bit more friendly in terms of the, and useful in the output it provides, it will tell us 17 vulnerabilities via 90 vulnerable paths. This is very, very useful information because it's just, the 17 vulnerabilities are actually things that I need to potentially be careful about, but they are being injected via 90 different ways. So this is where the asymmetric aspect of the thing goes in, right? It's not 17 vulnerabilities that will require 17 remediation actions. It's not as simple as that. And uh, this is a bit too tiny, but hopefully it will show the hierarchy. So here we have things like Node, for instance. Do I have my mouse somewhere? I do, yes. Uh, Node, uh, is Nick, for instance, supports NPM and Yarn. In Java, it supports Maven and Gradle. Go, it supports DAP and GoVenda. SourceClear, for instance, for Go, supports all of this stuff. JavaScript supports NPM, Bower, and Yarn. Like, all of those use potentially different public registries to restore their dependencies, those dependencies will be indexed using different criteria, and the way those specs, which will in turn become dependency metadata against which we will match our vulnerability data feeds to determine whether something is vulnerable or not, require our software composition analysis to, to be able to correlate both. 
So this means that our SCA2 needs to know how things are indexed in NPM, how things are indexed in Yarn, how things are indexed in Maven, how things are indexed in Gradle, and be able to turn that into some canonical representation, which it will use to match that against the vulnerability data sources. This is the core problem of software composition analysis, right? We're not, we're, not, we're not even in remediation mode yet. We're just talking about visibility, okay? So, yeah, we get deeper into this once we get to the remediation side of things. And uh, if you go OS dependency check, it actually supports a bunch of very interesting formats because OWASP dependency check, different than many of these other tools, it actually does a smart decision in the sense that it does not require you to build your software using it. You build it and then you scan it. And this means that as long as it can find files it can parse and extract the metadata from, it doesn't care which dependency resolution solution you use, right? So. This is why it talks about file formats rather than build systems or platforms. So they say, yeah, we support package JSON. Yeah, we support node security projects packs. We support jar files, WAR files. We support CMake files, CMake list files, EXE, DLL, ZIP, TA, whatever. Like it supports all of these different things. But what it does essentially is to parse the files, extract the metadata from them, and use that to match against our vulnerability data feeds. Is it clear so far, guys? Because I'm potentially rushing this a bit. <laughs> so we have all this stuff, which is related to uh, dependency resolution, okay? But because it's too simple, let's add another dimension to that, right? So we go into semantic versioning, or, which is the way that NPM calls it, but other uh, dependency resolution systems will have similar solutions for that. What this essentially is, you don't say simply, I depend on library X version 1, 2, 3. I say, I depend on library X on version 1, 2, 3 or something that backwards compatible to that. Which means that I don't know which version I'm going to get until I actually build my stuff, because what this thing will do is, it will talk to the registry it will fetch the latest version that matches my specification and then it will add that to my build. So if, if I want something that's one, two, three or later and backwards compatible, I might get one, two, four, one, two, five, one, two, six, one, two, ten. I don't know, right? And maybe one, two, five is vulnerable, but one, two, ten is not. And the visibility problem now depends on more information that's only available to us at dependency resolution time. Right. Again, this is the example for Node. Maven supports similar syntax. Gradle supports similar syntax. Uh, the Scala B2 supports similar syntax. Every one of those tools will have different syntaxes for this, but pretty much all of them support something, something similar. Because obviously, you want to give a way for developers to always be using the latest version of whatever they want, just in a backwards compatible way. Right. So what this means in practice, and I'll show this in the demo because it's always more fun to do this live. So just do. So just create an empty JavaScript project, okay? So this is literally my package JSON, there's nothing in it. Sorry, let me just do this. So what this will do is, it will install Express version 4.1.0, and it will save that in my package JSON. So this will actually go and update my package JSON file, right? So this will resolve my dependencies, there you go. And then it found, oh, whoa, you have 21 packages. This is another one I failed to mention. This is NPM audit. Uh, I did not mention this because NPM audit does not exist outside of NPM. It's actually a feature of the NPM package uh, dependency uh, manager itself. So it's not a full-on software composition analysis solution, a generic one. But again, very, very, very good. And if you're, if you're doing JavaScript code, then by all means, leverage this. 
right? And uh, the first thing I want to show you guys is that it added this tiny little thing here, okay? And uh, this is default behavior for NPM. Even if I tell it not to, it will by default use backwards compatibility flags for us. If you go to our Semver man page, <clears throat> it will mention to us the uh, ba -ba -ba, range, X ranges, tiled ranges, carrot ranges. Carrot ranges allow changes that do not modify the leftmost non zero digit in the major minor patch tuple. In other words, allows patching minor from 100 to something like this, right? So what this thing will do is it will essentially allow us to go to 4.1. whatever, but not 4.2, pretty much. And uh, this thing in Express is actually vulnerable, right? So, but the interesting thing is if I do an NPM LS, Sorry, NPM LS Express. Damn it, I picked a really bad example. Let me do another one. <laughs> yes. I missed one digit, it's actually this that I wanted. What am I doing wrong? Okay, I'll cheat and use my video. <laughs> <laughs> so my dependency says, ah, yeah, this of what 16. Okay, so if I do an install, it looks clean, all right. But if I do an LS on that, you will see that I actually got 16.4. This is all I wanted to show you guys, but yeah, live demos. So essentially the point what I'm trying to make here is that I don't know which version I'll be getting until I actually go and fetch the latest version that's backwards compatible to my spec, right? So maybe 4.16.0 is vulnerable, but when I built it, I did not get that. I got 4.16.4, and 4.16.4 clearly is not vulnerable because it's not being reported by NPM when it installs it. And this means that I cannot know which version I'm gonna get by just looking at the manifest file again. I couldn't tell the entire set of dependencies because I need to build the entire dependency resolution tree. And not even that, even for my direct dependencies, stuff I have written explicitly on my manifest file, I might get a different version than the one that's specified there if I use semantic versioning. So you have the dimension of transitive dependencies and you have the dimension of later backwards compatible versions now added to this mix, right? So knowing whether I'm actually using something like this now became a much, much co more complicated problem, right? And this is what I call temporal build dependency resolution for the lack of a simpler name. And essentially it means that you don't know what you get until you actually go and build it, right? And uh, this, is, this has another very, very interesting side effect. Imagine I'm Equifax, and now I want to check whether I'm using a vulnerable version of uh, struts in any other of my software, right? And imagine I'm actually mature enough that I'm, I have all these things in build pipelines and I'm able to trigger builds of all my other pieces of software automatically by clicking a button and then running software composition analysis and all of them. Well, guess what? If I'm using semantic versioning on that, this means that when I build them, I'm getting the latest fixed version of struts now because maybe the version range I specified includes the fixed version and now all my software will look clean. Doesn't mean that the version that's in production is clean. It means that when I build it now, it's clean. Awesome, right? I have no visibility about this unless I actually tag my stuff 
and keep track of when it was scanned, how it looked at the time, so that I can go back and revisit it, and I can track which instances I have deployed, used which build that was done at which point in time. Awesome. More information to keep track of, right? And now let's get back to our vulnerability data sources. I have NVDCV feeds. These have been mentioned to death. I won't go into depth. Uh, we have vendor advisories. So maybe I own a library, right? And I might be an open source developer, or maybe it's something that's owned by a larger organization, like, say, the Apache organization, which maintains struts, right? Or the Spring Foundation, or whatever it is, right? And there's the fuzzier stuff, like source clear claims. They do commit log analysis, use machine learning to extract security advisories from commit logs. Whether that's fact or not, it's up to debate. They're not going into much detail about that. The fact is they do have a lot of findings which do not have CVE information attached to them. So they definitely are doing some stuff that's not just feeding off the free data sources, right? NVD, this is what a CPE looks like. It's probably, it's readable, yeah. So you can see here that this is Express 2.5.3. Interestingly enough, this is the, if you search for Express as a CPE without any other restrictions in NVD, this is the single hit you get. And we know as a fact that's not the only Express vulnerability out there. And the reason is because some of the other vulnerabilities have been published under different CPEs which might or might not be picked up by you too, because depending on the version of Express you're using, it might or might not get that thing in your dependency resolution tree. Because dependency resolution trees also change in time. As, if I go here and I say I want Express version, uh, sorry, 4.10.0, this is my tree, sorry. This is my tree, okay? And I'll just change here for the latest one, which for 16.4. And you guys can see that I get a slightly different tree. Right? So that's awesome. Different versions get different dependency resolution, resolution trees, which means that I might or might not get or not hit on a specific CVE because maybe, and again, this is a good thing, but still, the fact that those things just add more dimensions against which you have to match your data just makes the possibility of missing a hit incredibly high. This is actually Express Security Advisories, right? So here you have a bunch of things that clearly did not come from dependencies. So Express here mentions, yeah, we have debug, we have fresh, we have this, we have that. These are all vulnerabilities that do affect us, but they came from dependencies we use, okay? But this here, these are actual Express things. And I, and I went down and I actually chased those things up. So if you go to CVE 2015 11.64, we can actually do that right now. Uh, let me just check my time. I think we're good in time. You just, it's uh, 2015, 1164. You will see that. Where is the CPE for this? It's actually serve static. It's not tagged as express. If you go to the other one, you got similar results. So what gives, you know? And uh, this means that something like say dependency check, if serve static is not a dependency uh, of express, then it, it won't get a hit, right? So it gets tricky. And finally, as I mentioned, source clear claim they do machine learning over commit logs. Like, we don't know what that looks like. They don't make that information publicly available. That uh, talk that I mentioned at the beginning, they try to describe how they go about it, but it's very, very vague. Uh, 
The fact is they do have a lot of data they have collected because SourceClear does something very interesting, which is they do basic static analysis on the code to actually determine whether you're calling a, uh, a method in a dependency that actually exposes you to a vulnerability, which might be a good criteria to determine whether you should focus on fixing a specific thing or not. In reality, that only works in statically typed languages, not dynamically typed ones. So yeah, if you're doing this for JavaScript, tough luck, right? So yep, this is what it looks like. We combine a dependency tree, you get a vulnerability data source, you mish mishmash all them together, you do your magic to ca get canonical representations of the metadata from the dependencies, the metadata from the vulnerability data sources, you see what matches, and you end up with a bunch of vulnerable dependencies you need to fix, right? These things will also be sitting at different nodes in your resolution. We get to that when we get to remediation. But before that, I just wanted to show you guys, this is uh, source clear, right? So here you see that we have a bunch of findings that actually have no CVEs linked to them, which seems to indicate that this is not public data. Where, the, where did they get this from? They don't tell us, right, necessarily, but we have access to this. SourceClear actually does something very, very nice to address the problem I mentioned around keeping track of which deployed version is vulnerable to what because they actually require your code to be submitted along with configuration management information. You cannot scan unless you explicitly tell it to source code with uh, SourceClear that has been tempered since it was cloned out of a repo. You actually need to provide a specific command line argument to tell, yeah, like, I know this code has been tempered, I want to scan it regardless. Because the idea is that you want to trace a path from the state in software co in configuration management that actually has that exact same manifest. So that they know that, yeah, this build was this guy here, and I know that this guy here had this, these things at the time it was built. Right, which is a very, very important piece of information to keep track of when you try to do this retroactively on stuff that's already in production. Uh, it also does, as I mentioned, the direct, sorry, the vulnerable methods, which is, yeah, maybe I'm only vulnerable if I call method X, Y, or Z. It will actually go and try to parse your source code to see if you call these methods, and if you do not, then maybe it's not such a priority for you to update your dependency. And they also do the direct libraries, which is they remove the transitive dependencies from this output if you click this thing. And this means that you can focus on the stuff that you can immediately address first and then focus on the transitive dependencies later, which are a much tougher problem to crack, right? Which leads us to remediation, right? Now we know those things are in our software. How do we fix that, right? And... Uh, this is our, again, back as JSON, simple project. Again, this is uh, Express 4.10.0. We know it's vulnerable. This is just to show the happy path scenario, right? So NPM install already complained to us. Yeah, yeah this, thing is, uh, this thing is vulnerable, right? Let's fix it. And then I do NPM audit, which is awesome. Use it. Again, it does mention the whole paths and uh, vulnerabilities uh, things, and it, all it took was that, okay? So I did an NPM audit fix. It upgraded my Express to 4.16.4, and that's it. If I had automated testing, if I had regression testing, if this happened in my build pipeline automatically, awesome, right? So, as I mentioned, remediation effort is directly related to the dependency resolution graph complexity, right? The number of paths leading to a vulnerable dependency, restriction, uh, versioning restrictions, those happen at our uh, edges here. Oh, okay. <laughs> I don't know what happened. But yeah, like, those happens at our edges here. So like, when Express includes something like debug, I will have... The thing, like, the, the thing in the manifest saying, yeah, it's actually debug version X, Y, Z, or later, or backwards compatible, or whatever it is. So those restrictions are actually happening at the edge levels here, right? And you can see that, for instance, MS, and MS is one of the vulnerable things that come with uh, Express 4.10.0, it gets introduced via six different paths. It just so happens that 
Express itself is quite good at keeping, keeping track of this stuff. So they do manage to update their direct dependencies and the stuff they depend on as well. So if something sits under their specific subtree, you're probably in luck. Might not be the case for different libraries. Right? So this is actually trying to do it for the juice shop. And I have a bunch of them. And if I do the same trick again, because NPM audit fix is awesome, then NPM audit fix will try its best. But yeah, I only fixed three of your guys, sorry. Right, and uh, it does mention, yeah, you might want to force this but it can potentially break your stuff. And yes, breaking changes. Upgrades are often not possible. Sometimes you have a no, a version, no longer, sorry, you don't have a later version that fixed this. Dependency might be introduced via multiple paths, all different kinds of possibilities here, right? Highly recommend reading this paper. This is not really security focused, but talks about the reasons why people change APIs and why they can introduce breaking changes. Also so happens to be written by a Brazilian guy, so double kudos for that. Uh, so remediation, the problem is, and this is the biggest challenge I find, is like when it can't happen, you can't sync whitelist stuff, right? Because if you whitelist it, this means that it will, you will never come back and revisit that problem. So you need to, capture that risk and set a deadline. The problem is not all of those tools are equal when it comes to accommodating a workflow like that, right? So like, unless you have absolute certainty that that software is not gonna be maintained and is gonna be replaced by something else in a very, very short time frame, do not whitelist stuff because this would just become code rot. It's just that not code that you, it's not code that you, re, you wrote yourself, which means that it would be less visible and which means that the likelihood of someone actually going and make the effort of fixing this later on, it's much, much lesser than code that you actually wrote. Right, so Snick is awesome in this because the Snick will actually allow you to do things like this. So as you can see here, the first one I was able to fix, but the second one has no fix. So Snick asks me, so what you wanna do? Oh, I wanna ignore this, but I wanna ignore this for 30 days only. And after 30 days, this thing will start be, to be picked up again. And that's what I want, right? Because if I don't do this, it won't come back and bite me and I will forget about it, right? Snick will also retroactively get in touch with you if they, found, if they find a fix to something they've scanned in the past. So if I scan the library, that library was found to be vulnerable, but there was no upgrade path. Snick still keeps the scan data because it's a SaaS, so they have the data in the cloud with them. They will come back to that data and say, hey, that thing is scanned in the past that you couldn't fix, you now can fix it, go and do it. And like uh, Nina showed this as well, it can even do it, generate the PR automatically for you if you're using something like GitHub. So it will, it will go to Snick and say like, yeah, yeah, create the merge request for me. It will create the merge request, you go review it, you test it, yeah, it looks good. If, again, if you trust your automated testing, you go and merge it, see if the build uh, succeeds, if the build succeeds, profit, right? And yeah, there you go, Snick boat. If your project's open source, they will do this automatically for you. Once they find something vulnerable and is registered with Snick, they will automatically create this pull request for you. You just go and need to click a freaking button to say, yes, I accept this merge. And this brings us to the second challenge, which is maintenance, right? So, so far, oh, ho, ho. Thanks, Microsoft. <laughs> Let's see if... We're good. So, so far we have covered stuff on the build side of things, which comes from the left, right? It comes from the developers. But once something is in production, how do I keep track? If no one is actually building this thing anymore because maybe development stalled, how do I get visibility on these things, right? So I need to keep this cycle going, right? Uh, the other thing is, even if something was clean in the past, because this comes 
it's more aligned with the patch management side of things. This means that new vulnerabilities on existing dependencies that were clean at the time might be found, right? So I need to keep this cycle going, okay? So, and this introduces another important element, which is the deployed versions and archival tags. Actually, uh, on Matt Jones talked, uh, he, he showed the SDL flow. One of the things that SDL does at release time, they suggest is you gotta do release archival and tagging. You gotta know which configuration management tag, ideally which commit hash actually was used to build something that made its way to production. This is the only way you can identify something that's been impacted by a new vulnerability because you know the actual manifest and the de entire dependency resolution tree of something that made its way to production, right? So, Snick again to the help. Snick will tell us about the stuff. If you scan something in the past and it looked clean, Snick will keep that data. And if later on a new vulnerability pops up, they will go and compare the previous scan data against the new vulnerability data and say, hey, that thing that looked clean is no longer clean anymore. Go there and fix it, right? The other way we can look at this is via our artifact registries. And I don't know if artifact is within E or an I, but my Australian dictionary told me you guys write it with an E. I'm used to having it with an I, but whatever. <laughs> and uh, the idea here is like I use something as a middleman and you proactively block, block people from downloading stuff you know is vulnerable. So you have Sonatype Nexus Firo for that. You have JFrog Artifactory for that. And these guys allow you to uh, like block known bad stuff from making its way into builds. The problem with this really is that, yeah, so our clip players, this is a Nexus IQ server, which is just a visualization uh, solution on top of the Nexus, the Sonatype Nexus platform. Uh, and then this is integrated with the firewall. It talks about dependencies which are sit currently sitting in the registry, which have no vulnerabilities associated with them. Now, the main limitation with this stuff is that it will only work if obviously you prevent your developers from fetching stuff from public repos. Otherwise, it's just gonna walk around you, right? And the other thing is because it's kind of a, an access control kind of thing rather than a specific software composition analysis solution. This means that you get broken builds, but you don't necessarily get the data about why it broke. You might get a 404 saying, hey, I couldn't fetch the version of this dependency. So this means that I cannot meet the requirement for your build. It won't necessarily tell you why, unless you actually go to the registry and look at the reason why this thing was blocked. So GitHub is another one. This has already been mentioned by a number of people, so just quickly go through it. So GitHub now has insights, right? Uh, we can go here and show this quickly because I'm running short of time. Sorry about that. So if I go here, insights, dependency graph, it will show me all my stuff, and if I had dependency, sorry, because I'm not logged in, it won't show me here, but it would have this alerts thing here if I was logged in, because obviously we don't want to people to know about vulnerable dependencies if you're not the project owner, right? Uh, then it will show something like this to you. And again, you can literally go and click one of the, each one of those, create the corresponding PRs if there are, there are later fixed versions of those things directly from GitHub, do leverage that. And GitHub, again, I had some demo of that, but Nina showed it already beautifully. Uh, like you, integrating GitHub with Snick is trivial, right? Do it, you get things like this, which is freaking awesome. You get Snick results on pull requests for everything some, someone wants to merge in a project. You do want something like that. This means that the person who will be reviewing this code does not need to look to the package JSON, see what new dependencies were added and check if those dependencies are vulnerable. Snick will tell them that, right? So the end message of all this stuff. Most important one, dependencies are not a list. They're not a bill of materials. They're not a manifest. They are a complex graph, right? And that graph potentially will have a crap ton 
of edges leading to specific nodes. And if your vulnerability lies in a highly connected node, good luck getting rid of that. It's incredibly painful. The remediation cost depends on, this, on that graph complexity, right? So it's not just a matter of how many components are affected. It's how connected those components are. You will not, you often not be able to fix things immediately, right? Particularly in the case of transitive dependencies. That does not mean you should whitelist your stuff. This is one case, and I failed to mention that, where the OWASP solution is actually kind of crappy because OWASP dependency check suppression is done via XML files. So, and once you, up, uh, you whitelist something, it's whitelisted until someone goes back and removes the thing from the XML file, which makes it really not friendly for a workflow where you need to come, keep coming back to those things. New vulnerabilities will pop up even if you're not developing your code anymore, right? And pretty much all of the products have something lacking on them. There is no silver bullet solution in this space yet. Uh, I kind of like the sneak workflow. I kind of like the source clear data sources. I kind of like how easy it is to integrate something like a NPM audit or a WASP dependency check with existing open source tooling, but none of them are perfect at this point. So, yep, don't be a stranger. This is me, uh, get in touch. Uh, I like to talk about this stuff a lot in case it wasn't obvious by my tongue during this talk. And, uh, yep. On some lights for you. And that was almost on time. <laughs> Questions? Anyone?